to Thrive, a show about work, community, and creativity. I'm your host, Janet McKenna-Lowry. Today's guest will be the multi-talented Trenda Lofton, and we'll talk about building community through art, work, and land in the second half of the show. Often on this half of the show, I will review a book, and I'm not going to review a specific book, but I want to talk about the concept of personality. The Oxford English Dictionary defines personality as the combination of characteristics or qualities that form an individual's distinctive character. Similar words are character, nature, disposition, temperament, makeup, persona. Psychology has a very specific definition. Psychology says that personality refers to individual differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Our problem as people, human beings in the 21st century, is the way that we seem to feel that personality is fixed and that it is predictable. It's not. People are always trying to find ways to nail down the predictability of personality. There are all sorts of systems that purport to do this because there is big money in being able to distill human beings down to a very specific personality and treat them accordingly. For example, There's a lot of predictability in business if you can say this person is like this and then put them in that box and keep them in that box forever. So this is especially prevalent in business literature and business training and business schools is this idea that you can somehow nail down personality. It comes from, to give people the benefit of the doubt, Part of this comes from the acknowledgement that we're not all the same. So some of it is this idea that maybe if we could figure out the ways in which we're different, we could accommodate people differently. And certainly when we talk about cultural differences, that's unbelievably valuable and valid. Even just that concept of different cultures have different standing measurements. So if you stand too close to someone from one place, they're going to feel very uncomfortable. If you stand too far from others and knowing that in advance can help you better accommodate your relationship with this person. That is sort of the kind read on this. The less kind read and I fear more fundamental read is let's assume we can really truly know about other people and then never give them a chance to grow or never give them the benefit of the doubt that they may be different in other contexts. So one of the most popular currently is the Enneagram. The Enneagram has nine different types of people. The reformer, the rational, idealistic type, principled, purposeful, self-controlled, perfectionistic. The helper, caring, interpersonal type demonstrative, generous, people-pleasing, and possessive. The achiever, success-driven, pragmatic type, adaptive, excelling, driven, and image-conscious. The individualist, the sensitive, withdrawn type, expressive, dramatic, self-absorbed, and temperamental. The investigator, the intense cerebral type, perceptive, innovative, secretive, and isolated. The loyalist, the committed, security-oriented type, engaging, responsible, anxious, and suspicious. The enthusiast, the busy, fun-loving type, spontaneous, versatile, distractible, scattered. The challenger, powerful, dominating type, self-confident, decisive, willful, and confrontational. And the peacemaker, easygoing, self-effacing type, receptive, reassuring, agreeable, and complacent. These are words. These are concepts. These are constructs put on people. And I'm going to bet that most of us look at that list and have a couple of reactions. One of them is you belong to so many of them that it's a meaningless list. But you may aspire 
to be one of them and do everything you can to data select the kinds of things you like, the type of person you are, to fit into one of them, to form an identity around this artificially marketed personality structure that is as completely divorced from reality and meat-based human beings as it is possible to be. You can't distill a person into whatever this is, eight words. You'll notice every single one of these had what could be considered two positive words, principled purposeful, demonstrative generous, adaptive excelling, expressive dramatic, and two negative words, self-controlled. I don't know that I would call that a negative word, but perfectionistic definitely is. People-pleasing and possessive, excel-driven and image-conscious, self-absorbed and temperamental. These don't go together necessarily. Being expressive and dramatic do not make you self-absorbed and temperamental. Those are one of my favorite, favorite descriptive phrases, false dichotomies. They're not, they don't go together. They're not opposites. They're not even, they're not linked. They're not in any way affiliated with one another. And you can't even find data that says, well, most people are. They're not. People are a mix. Let's talk about the elephant in the personality room, Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs was developed in the early 20th century by this woman, Catherine Briggs, and her daughter, Isabel Briggs Myers. They both read a book by Carl Jung, and when Catherine, who had zero training, no academic background, nothing, she read a book, when she met her daughter's fiance, she said, gee, he seems different than you. And the two of them decided that their rather limited reading of Jung meant there were personality types that were testable. Carl Jung hated that they used his research this way because he knew from extensive professional experience that human beings don't work this way at all. And he thought it was a disservice as it is. So you may have run into Myers-Briggs. I hope you don't since it's nonsense, but it wants to make you decide a type of four letters. It's even more reductive. The Enneagram is ridiculously reductive. Myers-Briggs is just hilariously reductive. Are you outwardly or inwardly focused? Extroversion, introversion. Are you sensing or intuition? How do you prefer to take in information? How do you prefer to make decisions, thinking or feeling? How do you prefer to live your outer life, judging or perceiving? First of all, talk about false dichotomies. People are introverted or extroverted very much depending on their company and the situation. No introvert is introverted all the time. No extrovert is extroverted all the time. And creative people swing back and forth. Thinking is not the opposite of feeling. And it doesn't take a lot to see how much that false dichotomy holds up patriarchy and sexism. Thinking and feeling are two things on the same side of the coin. It is a fundamental and utterly flawed understanding of how the brain works to believe that thinking and feeling are on two different axes. Judging and perceiving, same thing. Sensing and intuition, no. These just, they're meaningless. They are words and they are meaningless. And you can combine them in 16 utterly meaningless ways. And one of the ways you can tell that this is just hilarious garbage is most people can't take the same test twice. And it rests on this utterly erroneous belief that somehow personality is fixed. I want to go back to Enneagram for a minute and those two negative words about each of the personalities, as it says it's going to describe, self-controlled, perfectionistic, people-pleasing, possessive, image-conscious, driven, self-absorbed, temperamental, secretive, isolated, anxious, suspicious, distractible, scattered, willful, confrontational, agreeable, and complacent. All of those are not even personality markers but they sure are trauma markers. So they're very shaming as well that 
it locks somebody into being seen as here are two good things about you. Here are two bad things about you without ever understanding that this person is doing their best and that if they're going to grow, they need the space to be able to find out where their pain is that's leaking out as perfectionism, pain that's leaking out as being possessive, that's leaking out as being self-absorbed and temperamental. Those are pain points, not bad aspects of your personality. And the only good thing I can say about Myers-Briggs is that it's less inherently judgmental, but people are plenty judgmental about it. You can often hear people making big sweeping statements about introversion and extroversion that are so detached from actual lived experience and anything that can be proven or replicated that both of those are as scientific and as data-driven and as pointless as astrology. And hilariously, I looked up a thing to see how similar astrology personality types were to these other frameworks. I found this on the nuclear physics group at UC Davis, and I'm just hoping that it's just for funsies. Aries, adventurous and energetic, but also selfish and quick-tempered. Taurus, patient and reliable, but also jealous and possessive. Gemini, adaptable and versatile, but also nervous and tense. And all 12 birth signs have that kind of personality types harnessed to them. So which is it going to be? Is it going to be that you take the Enneagram, but then it turns out you're a Sagittarius, and so you're blindly optimistic, but the Enneagram said you were fun-loving? The thing about all these, and I have suffered through quite a few of them, and I've had long discussions with people who desperately want to change my mind without data because they feel like this describes them. I don't doubt that feels like it could describe you. But that means it's aspirational for you. Even the things where you're like, but that is like me. I am blindly optimistic and careless and irresponsible. First of all, those are not fixed points. And are you so blindly optimistic and careless and irresponsible that you crash into things? No, of course not. So it is very context driven. So in the end, it is a fortune cookie. It is astrology. Your INFP, sure, on the day you took the test, when you thought of the examples in your head, when it said, when you're in this kind of a situation, what do you do? You've been in that situation hundreds of times. Pick one, but you did different things. You chose differently when it was a teacher than when it was a peer. You chose differently when it was a child than when it was a parent. So no, fixed to nothing. Okay, so what? Why are we here? There's an unholy alliance between poorly researched psychology and sociology, both of which fields continue to suffer from an inability to replicate famous studies, studies that then become these psychology businesses, TM, of their own, and business as a field's deep desire to predict and glue down human behavior, both for marketing purposes and for internal management. And we start this nonsense early. If we as adults talk about personality on kids, they've barely learned to walk. And we're talking about their fixed personalities. We box them up and we screw them up and we limit their ability to see the world as a place where they can grow and develop. And I have very strong feelings about this, but I can also tell you it's a lifelong disservice to a child. I had a 100-year-old honorary grandmother. She was born in 1909. She died in 2009. And her parents and her extended family told her as a child she was the smart one, but not the pretty one. Told another that she was the pretty one, but not the smart one. Told another one that she was the friendly one, but not the smart or the pretty one. Honestly, it's abusive. That is an adult reading something onto a kid and limiting all of their ability to see their full selves as children and adults. 
actually, I had to stop her from using that kind of language on my kids because it's such an unnecessary box. This woman who we called grandma, she was perfectly attractive. To be told that she couldn't be pretty and smart, her sister labeled every photograph she ever put in a book. Her sister was excellent at systems and organization, and she's being told she's not smart? And the other one gets to be, what, Miss Congeniality as friendly? I've also read a fair amount of interesting articles over the years about how this often happens a lot of times around two children in a family who are close in age and the same gender. And that varies, but to have a good one and a bad one. And the example that was sort of the clearest on this was William Bulger, who became head of the UMass system in Massachusetts. I want to say he was either a governor or he wanted to be elected governor. I think he was in Congress. Anyway, his brother was Whitey Bulger, who was a famous gangster and criminal and multi-murderer. And they were the good son and the bad son. And when you have one, you have to have the other. And that that is designated and then supported by the family as your identity and your personality without any chance of ever getting out of it. It is, as you can tell, very, very obviously derogatory to the one who's considered bad. It is also unbelievably limiting to the one who's considered good because they're going to be in a place of fear all the time about truly doing what they want because of the fear of being seen as bad and the conflicting loyalties within the family because William Bulger was pretty famous for doing very sketchy things that were in service of saving or protecting his bad brother. The only way not to do this is to simply don't use this language around kids. Just refuse to talk about their personality, what they're like, as if you have any real knowledge about it, except in the most general and growth mindset terms. For example, saying to a kid, you remember how hard it was last year when you wanted to learn to swim and you had a lot of fears around it, but you knew someday you'd get it? Look at how great you're doing now. That's fine. That's not telling a kid, well, his personality is he's been afraid to swim. You can use it in those growth mindset terms, and that's it if you want to have healthy adults. In retrospect, when they're fully grown and you have a trusting relationship with them, you can talk about what they were like in your perception when they were kids. Oh, it's funny you still like that because I remember... That was something you really loved at three. And I thought, no, it's a phase. You'll grow out of it. And you actually still like that. That's so interesting to me. That's fine. You could even get to a point of feeling like it's a personality. You were always a cheerful kid. Do not observe it when they're still young. You do not know what kids have had to hide. You do not know what coworkers and the people you manage have had to hide and in what contexts. So by overlaying them with your judgments, all you can really do is damage them or damage the relationship or elicit protective hurt behavior, all of which are a huge waste of time and resources and affection and generosity. It just don't waste it. So what's better? Well, first of all, what's better is knowing that you cannot make these judgment calls, not as a teacher, not as a parent, not as an aunt, not as a friendly adult. You are only speaking from your perception, and your perception is pretty much limited to one, unless you are conducting a well-designed, multi-replicable study, then you really have no business making these judgments about others and trying to fix their personality. However, you can reach out to some various ways of making sure that people's strengths and weaknesses are understood or at least acknowledged. That's fine. One that I like, you know, again, it's going to have some limits, but is called the Clifton Strengths Finder. And I like it because of the way it's set up. I would actually maybe call it talents, not strengths, but it kind of depends on how you see the word. 
There's executing, people with a dominant executing theme know how to make things happen, influencing, people know how to speak up, take charge, make sure the team is heard, relationship building, although frankly that should be all of it, but people who seem to be especially talented at that, and then strategic thinking who can absorb and analyze and make better information now. Now part of that suffers from what I like to call the Harvard Business School curse of four domains. Harvard Business School, and it becomes a parody of itself when you start looking for this. Harvard Business School loves four domain graphs. Top right, top left, bottom right, bottom left, as if everything can be distilled into those four. Every complex thing that's ever been done can be put in those four. Of course it can, but is it meaningful? Under very limited circumstances, sure, it's, it's a way that Harvard loves to see the world. Why don't you do five? Why don't you do eight? Why don't you do a hexagon? Why don't you make a starfish? You can do all these things. You can then TM them and start your own business around them. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are useful in any meaningful way. So it does suffer from that. And there's also a bit of a clickbait to Clifton Strengths Finder. You can buy the book. The book will describe all the whatever 37 words or however many there are and let you take a test that indicates your strengths. And I do find it to be, I found it to be fairly friendly. Like it was really talking about what I feel strong in. It wasn't good about having sort of an honest idea of what I might feel weak in and want to improve. But okay, you know, I definitely felt valued when I read it. However, having taken the test, if you want more information or deeper information, you got to pay more. A little bit of a pyramid scheme, clickbaity thing. And of course, you can't give away that book. The next person can't take the test. The book is just good to describe the results of the test. I don't begrudge anyone making money from their ideas, but... There is an aspect of this that's like, well, write your book and go and be a speaker and let the information get out in the world. It also doesn't have like real replicable science behind it, really. It's observational. It, it feels a little bit like a first do no harm. Another way to go about this is the Howard Gardner multiple intelligences. I know I've talked about those before. The nine basic ones, although I think there are a few more now. Verbal linguistic intelligence, well-developed verbal skills and sensitivity to sounds, meaning in the rhythm of words. Logical mathematical intelligence, the ability to think conceptually and abstractly, the capacity to discern logical and numerical patterns. Spatial visual intelligence, the capacity to think in images and pictures, to visualize accurately and abstractly. Body kinesthetic intelligence, and this is one of the things I think is the most important piece I ever got out of Howard Gardner. Having body intelligence is intelligence. And that is something that we, as a culture, we barely blink at anything besides look at any school. Reading, writing, math. List over. Everything else has to depend on those. Rarely do we honor those who have a heightened sense of body movement awareness, even though it is a legitimate way to be intelligent. Musical intelligences, the ability to produce and appreciate rhythm, pitch, and timbre. Intrapersonal intelligence, the capacity to detect and respond appropriately to the moods, motivations, and desires of others. Oh, that's interpersonal. Intrapersonal, to be a self-aware and in tune with your own feelings and values and beliefs and thinking processes. Naturalist intelligence, the ability to categorize and recognize plants, animals, other objects in nature. Existential intelligence, sensitivity and capacity to tackle deep questions about human existence as what is the meaning of life? Why do we die? How do we get here? One thing that I will be forever grateful to Howard Gardner about is his utter and absolute refusal to allow testing of these intelligences. I find that the critiques of Howard Gardner are that it's not replicable. But at no point is he saying these are fixed intelligences. These are, again, more like talents. And what he insists has to happen, and I 100% agree, is finding out through your relationships which of these appear to be strengths. Having found your strengths, what would you like to improve? If you would like to improve your verbal linguistic intelligence and you're very high on musical intelligence, 
then it's time to learn how to write lyrics. It's time to learn how to write poetry. Go through your strengths in order to address your weaknesses. I have done this with several children, and it has been immediately gratifying and freeing. It's a radically different way to look at, in this case, it's talking intelligences, but it's really referring to what we also consider to be personality. Can it even change or is it fixed? Well, Howard Gardner would point out, and even the Clifton Strength Finder would indicate that absolutely it can be. No one's ever going to be the top of all these things, and a test on any of them is inherently suspect. It has to do with self-reflection and honest conversations with those you have a relationship with. Something that businesses often try to short circuit and circumvent because it involves hiring people with soft skills and trusting them that that relationship building is worthwhile. And many businesses are what they consider risk averse to that kind of management. But that's unfortunate because it's a real sustainable way to build a functionally excellent team. People that feel safe and understood, people that are working within their strongest talents and finding ways to better improve their weakest, tends to be how we're happiest. Dr. Ellen Langer wrote the book Clockwise, which I reviewed a couple months ago and had this study of old men in 1981, where she made a world for them for a week that was when they were in their early 30s. And all of them walked out of that study as effectively younger men in their behavior, in their physical capacity, in their mental capacities. Your personality is absolutely changeable. Dealing with your pain will change your personality. So like I said, with the Enneagram, a lot of those indicate trauma. If you are, in fact, a lot of the ones for the uh, astrology also indicate pain and trauma. If you are able to process your pain and your trauma, your personality will change. Finding a way to be kinder to yourself allows you to be kinder to others. And some other things can help. Meditation and mindfulness, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which can help change your behavior and your belief systems. EMDR, which is the eye movement desensitization. I always forget the R, but it is an effective and proven way to treat and process trauma. Brain spotting, which uses a similar mechanism in your brain. Neurofeedback a therapeutic intervention that provides immediate feedback from a computer-based program and then uses sound or visual signals to reorganize and retrain the brain signals. Because someone with trauma may not be able to sustain a relaxed alpha state for long. If you have spent 50 years unable to get into a relaxed brain state, you are going to have things that really look like they're your personality when they were, in fact, your pain training your brain how to respond in a certain way. You may be unable to sleep. You may be unable to recuperate. Unprocessed trauma and pain always leak out somewhere. And then something that I've found really exciting recently is IFS, which is Internal Family Systems. I think I would prefer if it was called Internal Attachment Systems because Family can be a really fraught concept for a lot of people, but that's a therapy that acknowledges that, as Whitman said, we contain multitudes. We are the sum of our parts, and part of us wants to do well, and part of us wants to protect us. Part of us wants to be proud of ourselves, and part of us wants to criticize ourselves for not doing enough. And every time we have had an unprocessed trauma, We've created new parts around ourselves. And some of those parts are speaking to us from our deep childhood in ways that we may not be fully aware of, but still are triggered in our responses from. I'm just learning it. I am very interested in getting the training for it because I do some coaching and they do coach training. And I find that whole thing fascinating. And I found it beautifully helpful 
So the takeaway from all of this is, you're not four letters. You may display that at the time of a test under very specific circumstances. Change your circumstances, change whether you ate, and you're not those things anymore. People want desperately, businesses want desperately, schools want desperately for you to be predictable, for you to be an identity, for you to be a kind of personality. And it limits you and it hides the things you really do need to learn to process, which is pain. You're listening to Nine to Thrive, a show about work, community, and creativity. Past episodes are at working 9 to thrivecom That's with the number nine. Next up, I'll be talking with the multi-talented Trenda Lofton. With me today is Trenda Lofton, who's a worker owner of the Compost Cooperative Realtor with Caldwell, activist and theater consultant, playwright, director, actor, and complete renaissance woman. Thanks for coming on today, Trenda. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Janet. So what we talk about is balancing work, community, and creativity in any order. And a lot of people overlap and a lot of people have, like, it sounds to me like maybe you have sort of separate spheres that may overlap a little bit. So tell me a little bit about whichever one you want to talk about first, how, how you do the creativity you do or take care of yourself or community or the work that you do to pay rent. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think what I'll do is I'll start with the creative elements of, or I should say theater specific creativity work that I do, mm. because I, I truly believe that 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 work informs every other piece of what I do. So, you know, you mentioned that I'm a, a theater artist, so I love to write, I love to act, and I love to direct. And all of that for me is anchored in collective cooperation and collaboration. Mm-hmm. I really have anchored my theatrical career in co-creating new works, uh, primarily with folks who don't consider themselves theater people. Mm. So that work has looked like several different things. I had the opportunity to teach 7th through 12th grade theater for about four years here in the Valley. And that experience really made clear for me just how powerful young people are, Mm. just how important their, their vision and imagination for the ways that we can cultivate real and lasting change in our communities. So I felt I I continue to be in awe of the young people in the world that are really calling, I think, older folks to task around some things, which I'm just so grateful for. So as a theater teacher, anchoring in uh, collaborative processes and As a a theater maker working in collaboration with my theater company, The Real Live Theater, based out of Sunderland, but working throughout the Valley, I really, really hold at the core of how I move as an artist, as an organizer, and as a facilitator, the importance of deep and sincere listening, Mm. empathy, empathy building, right? So really seeking understanding from the folks that we are in community with and also play and Mm. joy, which I think contributes or I know contributes to my own healing and my own, I think, (laughs) longevity in the work you know I I mentioned before that I I like to call myself an artivist Mm. right so for me everything I do is also through the lens of how can I build more opportunities for greater equity in the world 
Okay. How can I move in a way that increases opportunities for for folks that have been historically excluded from certain things like like theater, like housing, like meaningful education, like telling one's own story um, and really being in charge of the shape that that takes? Yeah. So it's interesting because you're talking both about making theater but also there sounds like there's this under there's this like almost pre-making piece that's about uh, support and collaboration can you talk a little bit more about that like you were talking about co-creating new works and then but about the collaborative process which like it's not just a question of like i'll just talk about when when you were talking about your students you don't just like start on day one and then we'll put on this play it sounds like there's a whole piece before that about getting to the work and supporting the work of the other people there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think that there's space for being a director who, you know, has has your eye on a play and you want to produce that play. And that's amazing. That's just not quite that's not where I've anchored my my skill set. I really believe that theater is and can can be and is transformative and so when i think about how i like to approach creation the creative process for me one of the questions that i always start my processes with is what is it you need Mm -hmm. in order to feel fully present Mm -hmm. and brave in the work that we're doing That's interesting. Right. What is it that you want from this experience? Right. So that right from the beginning, it really is about we are in this together. Right. That we all come with our own histories, our own past experiences that have really impacted who we are and how we show up in space. So so one of the one of my core tenants is really thinking about thinking about that how to honor people's complex complicated Mm. histories and truths and you know folks are navigating systems right we're born into a culture and and systems that already exist and that experience has an impact on us not always negative and definitely not always positive so thinking about how we've been impacted by those things Right. And how we can mobilize ourselves through that. What kind of answers do you get when you ask people, what do you need to be able to create this? Ah, yeah. So it's a wide, definitely a wide range of answers. I've had the opportunity to co-create with women who are formerly incarcerated and or battling addiction. Wow. And, you know, some of it is like, I need to be able to take breaks, <laughs> oh. you know, when I want, right? Or when I need to, I need to be able to say no, mm. right? I think one of the things that I know my theater training included is like the yes and mentality, right? right? So when you're, when you're playing and creating, it's like you're, you're listening and responding and you say yes and you you further someone else's ideas and which I think can be a really powerful thing when that trust has been established. Mm, that's right. Interesting. And yeah. I think that that's the component that is often often left out of the theater process is how do we both invite people to the deepest parts of themselves which we know can often be quite painful right while also making sure that we are building the the structure to hold us all in that yeah right right yeah so so it's been you know things about like you know i've worked with folks who don't don't read well Mm. so so I, people who don't want to be called on to read unless otherwise, you know, unless sort of mm, they're given a heads up. Mm. Uh-huh. So for me, the things that I learned as a classroom teacher 
and things that I learned as as a theater maker and things that I learned about, you know, while while waiting tables and bartending, <laughs> right, is about like, how do you actually see who it is that you're working with and honor that human, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Above all else, yeah. right? Yeah, above all else, how can how can theater be a space for transformation, for dreaming, for calling out systems that have harmed us or people that have harmed us and strategizing around that and calling to action our community to recognize some of the patterns in in society, you know, that we yeah. can we can create something different. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. That's, that's deep work. <laughs> wow. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. I mean, it sounds very, uh, sustaining uh, financially though, uh, not as much perhaps. How do places get funding? I mean, arts education is always the first to go. Yeah, it's, you're, you're so right. And I think, you know, for me, it's been a combination of things. Right. I have not made my whole living on doing theater programs <laughs> right? by any stretch. I think part of, you know, maybe I'll use this moment to, to shift to some of my consulting work. Mm. So when I think, you know, I've said already that that theater can be transformative and that I integrate things that I've learned from working into working in theater into every other element of, of how I move and every other element of work I do. I, I love learning with people (laughs) and I love the act of like digging in together and creating and problem solving together. Those things are very much theater and they're also very much about change making and structural systems. Right. And I think, you know, so one of the things that I do is I, I consult for theater companies and theater departments Mm -hmm. around their racial equity and social justice efforts. Okay. And not just theater companies, also, you know, other organizations. And and that is part of how I've I've funded my my life, right? Mm. Is um I call myself an arts integrated equity consultant. Mm. So for me, oftentimes when people talk and think about strategic planning, there's a dryness yeah. uh, assumed in that process. Yeah. Even seeing strategic planning, I'm like, (laughs) you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not the, you know, I don't market myself as a strategic planner. However, I very much believe that when thinking about work culture or community culture or when dreaming about what you want the next five years to look like. Yeah that there's some magic that when you integrate an artistic or creative process into that process, it opens up a whole nother world. So that's part of how I, how I work is, you know, when I think about working with a group of people or a business or organization, I think about how can we take a creative approach right. to exploring some of some of these things, whether it's problem solving around inequities within the organization or it's, you know, dreaming about what you want your organization to be or be doing in the future. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, and actually, I was even just thinking about that. Like, I know we, we moved into the piece about your own work, but even these organizations, like funding them and getting that balance between, I don't know, the, the model that I really like is one that worked at a place at a nonprofit I worked a bunch of years ago, which was we'll do a fair amount of popular stuff so that we can support the stuff that nobody knows about yet. Mm-hmm. So let, mm-hmm. let's put on a holiday play that's not the Christmas Carol or, or in this case, it was a nutcracker. It's not going to be the most uh, like they'll still be creative, but it'll be kind of a dial in thing. But we'll make enough money on that that the next two things we do support are going to be things nobody has 
thought of yet. Like, I, and I, I, I kind of am into that. Like, charge wealthy people a bit more, and it keeps the mission going, and then it keeps the it, it, you can get the voiceless a voice if you do that. <laughs> And it's funny because you were talking about strategic planning and that's always where my mind goes is like, yes, but then like, how do we get enough money so that the mission stays and that other voices get heard? (laughs) Those two things. Yeah, absolutely. It's an incredible, incredibly important component of, of the journey, right? Yeah. Is that, that balancing the budget. Yeah. in the budget, especially, you know, one of the things that I I get really excited about is hearing people talking about and brainstorming about how to act, how to compensate artists well. Oh yeah. And every every team member of of that, you know, production, um, how to compensate them well for their for their time. And, you know, because I think even just participating in in theater in particular, mm. in sort of, I guess, your your classic Western mm. <laughs> style uh, white American theater, you know, it's like right. it, it takes tremendous amount of time, tremendous amount of resources. So resources, including time and money and space. Mm. Right. And so part of what I've been really excited to see is more folks making the effort to not only compensate people, but also thinking outside of of tradition of that style of tradition. Right. So when we think about all the different ways that theater and art show up, we don't actually need all of what we thought we needed oh, <laughs> or some would have us think that we need. Yeah. Talk about that. Elaborate on that. Cause I love that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think people all around the world have created theater with zero finances, mm. you know, with zero lights or with very few lights or with flashlights or with, right? Like, I think there are ways that we can relieve some of our, some of the ways that some have been, I think, constrained to this very narrow idea of what making theater looks like. Interesting. You know, so part of how I, you know, I mentioned that I often work with folks that don't consider themselves artists or or don't consider themselves theater makers and and i've i've created work with folks who are currently incarcerated right Right. so we aren't creating work that is on a stage with fancy lights and you know beautiful sound as fun as that is it's incredible Mm. right like i you know i'm definitely not speaking down to the beauty of a well-lit theater yeah but it's not the only way, right? And so the more we're able to think outside of the theater box, you know, the more folks will have access to creating and storytelling, right? Like how do we, in a room that is, you know, with, with no windows and no director's blocks and, (laughs) you know, you've got a couple of chairs and tables, how do you make something amazing out of that? Mm. Right. For me, that's that's life giving. I love, you know, there's that game. um, This is not a pen. Have you played that? No. How does it work? It's, you know, it's a silly little improv game where you, you know, you have a pen or a pencil and you're like, this is not a pen. This is a toothbrush. (laughs) And then you use it, you know, like as such, you know, it's how do we engage that level of imagination where we can say, you know what, we don't actually have a real couch. Right. How do we use our bodies to simulate? Right. So we, we, go to like, what do we have? What are the resources we have? And how do we make the most of those resources? Interesting. I have to say it's, you know, thinking about doing this in an institutional setting, like a, you know, a prison or someone just said something recently that I thought was so profound. They said, one of the reasons we think college is so critical to, you know, 
adult growth is because it's the last place we had where there was uh, communal living, cooperative sort of sharing, and we had the we had access to basic necessities, right? There's a place to eat, there's a doctor on the locally, and then everything else is community making and learning. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting... So the idea of an institution, like it almost... It's, it's almost lends itself a little better to building community than being out in the world where you're just, you have to try to find this. Mm. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to digest all the, all the pieces that you share. Cause I think, I, I think there's the, so I want to say yes, absolutely to what happens when you have a roof over your head, you have food that's accessible to you, you have, you have healthcare that's accessible to you, right? When those basic needs are met. Right. Not, absolutely. P.S., not to equate college with prison. In prison, I'm glad that there are programs for people to have something to do to build community but how hard it is to locate community. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's so, so I'll go back to kind of, you know, I think finishing that, that one thought, right? Sorry. So when you have all of your basic needs met, right? Yeah. Food, housing, healthcare. Let's just start there, right? Mm. And I'm going to, I'm going to amend those, right? So you have safe and affordable housing, you have adequate health care that you can afford, and you have safe and healthy food that you can afford, right? <laughs> right. When those three things are met, I absolutely agree with you that it, it, leaves more space for community building mm. it leaves more space for seeking out community right because right. you're not like oh how am i gonna get you know this next bill paid right right or this next meal for me and or my family i am not you know i do not believe that that the institutions that we just spoke of <laughs> you know, it, particularly jails and prisons. I don't believe that those actually tend to those three basic needs. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that being said, you know, I absolutely agree that when, when you're in the hustle bustle of getting your basic needs met and met well, um, or at least decently out in the world, it is so much harder to, to build community. And this makes me want to transition to the compost cooperative, right? Uh, and conversations about that, because I truly do believe that if we are able to shift our mindset mm. around ways of being in the world and ways of getting those needs met mm. from a more individualistic approach, which I think most of us have been trained in, a more collective and cooperative approach yeah. it not only helps ensure that more people have access to getting those basic needs met but it also increases access to community mm. mutual support and mutual uplift yeah. and 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 culture shifting yeah how does the how does that compost cooperative work what is it sure so the compost cooperative is a worker-owned business we're based in greenfield and we divert food scraps from the landfills by providing residential and commercial scraps pickup mm. so we have over 100 residential customers throughout franklin county that allow us to pick up their food scraps and we deliver those to martin's farm in greenfield and just roots in greenfield oh, okay. uh, so that those food scraps can actually be turned into what we call black gold, right? Into <laughs> compost. And so we're able to, to do that. Um, we're diverting several tons of, of food scraps every, every month, which is really, really exciting. Mm. 
And we're not only anchored in sort of that tangible, this is the work that we do of providing that hauling service, but we're also committed to providing living wage work opportunities for folks who've been impacted by incarceration and those oh, great. face barriers to employment. So, right. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. There's, it, it's funny. I'm not a super nostalgic person. I actually am really profoundly glad to be living here now, but sometimes there's things like what you're talking about and then streetcars and building building for public transportation where I go, we had it right for a period of time for a certain sub segment of people. But you know, they used, there used to be pickup of compost in cities, the the rag and bone men that there was just, they used to do that. (laughs) I feel like how is, how did the, I don't know. How did, how did cities and States just drop that ball so hard and walk away from it when it was in fact a set up system that worked for a long time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that's definitely a part of the the that's one of the directions we're trying to go, right? Is how can we work with cities and municipalities to to really recognize the importance of providing opportunities for folks to divert their food yeah. scraps from and, landfills. And both, of, and both of those things, honestly, a, a better, I'm sure I'll go into weeds all over the place with this, but uh, the second part you were talking about where it's work opportunities for people who have been incarcerated, the idea that people who have been routinely failed by so very many people and institutions and communities and then serve time through the court system and then come out to be failed again is so unspeakably awful to me. <laughs> like, it almost paralyzes me how awful it is to, to see, even when I, even when I apply for jobs or do job things and it says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Like it's so context dependent, you know, Sure. Absolutely. Maybe you don't want someone who was an embezzler to to be doing your finances. I get that. But they could be doing other things. (laughs) There are other jobs they could be doing. I don't know. Um, You know, and so so many people are, are railroaded through that. The idea, though, that, you know, you're just saying with the cities and states to just get more committed to these jobs where it would be fine to hire people out just just coming out and reintegrating into society and get them on their feet again is just terrific. I want to thank Trenda Lofton for talking with me today. We'll have the second half of our conversation next week. Her website is trendalofton.com and you can find more links, info, and listen anytime on working9to thrive.com and that's with the number nine.